The Arcane Formulas by William Walker Atkinson Lesson 3 Establishing the Ego 2 The practice of the exercises indicated by the formulas described in the preceding lesson, if carefully and faithfully practiced, will give to the neophyte a new sense of existence. He will realize by actual mental experience that he, the ego, is an entity having its existence on a plane higher than that of the physical body, and superior to the latter. He will also experience a realization of the power of mastery over the physical body, which he may employ in the direction of mentally treating the latter for physical wrong functioning, weakness, or irregularities of any and all kinds. With a little practice, he will be able to make his physical body a most responsive instrument of his mind and will, and may build it up and strengthen it as he may desire. This power, once acquired, will also enable him to treat the physical bodies of others to excellent advantage. When the neophyte actually realizes that he is independent of and superior to the physical body he will realize that he has the power to command his physical functions and those of others who have not attained the realization but let not the neophyte make the natural mistake at this point of considering that he has escaped the bonds of personality for he has not the arcane teachers first free their neophytes from the trammels and retarding influences of the physical body and in thus doing build up a still higher sense of personality. Later, this higher sheath is, in turn, discarded, and the ego focalizes upon its spiritual nature, its individuality. But the step of building up the incorporeal higher personality must be attained before the next higher is possible. Their own neophyte. Be not in too much haste to pass on to the next step. Master each step as you proceed. Thus do you rise naturally and easily on the ladder of attainment. Following the exercises indicated in the preceding lesson, the neophyte may now proceed with the work of establishing the ego. In its first stages. As follows. Exercise Placing himself in a position and condition of ease and repose. Let the neophyte meditate on the incidents of incorporeality or life independent of the physical body. Thinking of oneself as a physical being, one naturally and properly takes into account the incidents of corporeality or life in the body. For instance, he realizes that he may be hurt by fire, water, earth, air, or ether. He may be burned by fire, drowned by water, smothered or bruised by earth swept away by air, or injured by ethereal vibrations, such as electricity, etc. And, again, he may be wounded, meet with physical accidents, laid low by sickness, etc. These are the incidents of corporeal life. But, in meditation, by using the imagination intelligently, he is brought to a realization that none of these incidents are in effect upon the plane of the incorporeal life. Meditation and intelligent imagination will show the neophyte that in his astral body he might pass through fire unscathed, through water untouched, through earth without hurt or interference, through air without being swept off his feet, through the ether without regard to ethereal vibrations. None of these things of the physical plane have any effect upon the astral body, or disembodied ego. In some of the ancient occult initiatory rites the neophyte was taken out of his physical body, and in his astral form was bidden to plunge himself in the flames of the hottest fiery furnace, to throw himself from the highest precipice, to drop into a bottomless lake, not realizing that these things could not affect him in his astral fawn, and being bound up with the memory of the corporeal life. The neophyte would often shrink from the tests, but after being encouraged by example and precept he would submit to the test, joyfully, with a laugh on his lips, as he realized that, to him, 
In his astral form these corporeal things were non-existent. Mere dreams of the physical plane. Of course the actual experience in the astral is far more convincing than is the mere realization of the truth and meditation. But the latter must not be despised. For it gives one an intuitive realization of the truth. Which, once attained, tends to destroy fear and to impart a new sense of courage, invincibility and invulnerability and mastery, which permeates the entire being, and causes one to radiate power and strength. Likewise will come the realization that the ego, in itself, is incapable of hurt, harm, wounds, or sickness. These things belong to the corporeal life, and have naught to do with the higher self. The neophyte is enjoined to persevere and practice until he gains the actual experience and recognition that his higher self, his real self, is superior to all the incidents and accidents of the corporeal life, and that let come what will to his physical covering he himself is unhurt, whole, untouched, undisturbed. An old arcane teacher, over two thousand years ago, was once told that the world was coming to an end. Well, what is that to me? He replied. Resuming his study, he realized fully his invincibility. A similar tale is told of Emerson, who was halted in the street by an excited Millerite, who informed him, in strained tones, Mr. Emerson, the world will be destroyed in ten days. Well, what of it? replied Emerson, calmly. I don't see but what we shall get along just as well without it. The 19th century transcendentalist voiced the truth as clearly as did his predecessor in ancient Greece. The sense and realization must be experienced before it can be understood. It may be realized by practicing the formulas, as given herein. The next step indicated by the formulas, is that of focalizing the consciousness on the ego. This is still within the realm of personality but on a very high plane of that realm. A plane which gradually blends into the higher plane of individuality. It consists of bringing about an acute realization of one's existence as a center of consciousness and force. It tends to gather up the dissipated sense of personal existence, and bringing it to a focal point, into vivid and actual conscious realization preparatory to it being transmuted into the higher sense of individual existence. The following exercise will tend to bring about the desired realization. Exercise Let the neophyte place himself in a position, and condition, of rest and calm. Let him then meditate upon the great ocean of life in which the individual entities are but focal centers of consciousness and force. Let him picture himself, in imagination, as being an actual center, with all the universe revolving around him. Let him see himself as the pivot around which the universe moves. The central sun around which the infinite world and planets circle in their cosmic flight. Let him feel himself to be the focal center of the cosmos. And this is indeed, in accordance with the centuries-old occult axiom which informs us that the cosmos is infinite. Its circumference is nowhere. Its center is everywhere. Let the neophyte lose all thought of the outside world, in this meditation. Let him regard it as totally unmanifest if he likes. But see himself in actual existence and in full power. Let him realize I am to the fullest extent of his power of imagination and conception. A student of the arcane lessons has written us of his experience in this stage of realization. We quote from his letter, for it affords a typical instance of the phenomenon of the establishing the ego center. He says, On first reading, the arcane lessons appear to wipe out my eye, 
and to cause it to disappear within the one life when it resolved itself into the infinity of nothingness, at the end of the cosmic day. Right here, I began to sit up and take notice, with the result that my eye in a fierce effort to preserve itself from going to sleep, shone with such fierceness, clearness, and determination, that all was an infinity of nothingness right then. There was nothing remaining but just I. Then I fully understood how the one life could go to rest at the end of the cosmic day, and how I would be the awful lone witness of its rest. I had made the separation of the one life and the real life, or distinguished. The manifested life from the unmanifest. We quote this testimony because it brings out several steps in the evolution of the I Am conception. This student passed through the several stages at one leap. Attaining in rapid succession the realization of the center, and then, immediately following, the realization of the impersonal or individual ego, or real self, this latter stage forming the subject of our next lesson. The now familiar cult statement of I am should be used freely in practicing these exercises, for it tends to bring out the actual realization of real egohood which is the aim and goal of the formulas. The statement has been used by the arcane teachers, and other advanced occultists in all lands, for thousands of years. Its recent use is but a revival of the ancient initiatory exercises and rites. It is a tremendous statement of being and should be used reverently and with awe.